Okay, I'm going to call the meeting for APCD for uh, January the 11th. And, and also, the, um, I'd like to ask um, our past chair to help us with the Pledge of Allegiance for the Board of Supervisors, Kathy Lott. chair oh okay okay next item in the agenda is roll call supervisor bennett here supervisor park here supervisor long here supervisor foy here supervisor uh zaragoza here council member brennan here mayor holden mayor morgan here council member sharkey Okay, we have a quorum. Correct. Right. Thank you. The next item that we have, item number four, is a ceremonial swearing up in of Linda Parks, Peter Foy, Thomas Holden, Mike Morgan, and John Sharkey. And I think uh, they want you to stand and raise your right hand. Okay. When I say I, just say your name and I'll go on from there. I? Mike Morgan. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. I will. Well, congratulations. And we've had a lot of swearing in today, and, uh, and I think uh, we've got a, a next on board. Our next item is item number five, is election of chair and vice chair of the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District Board for the year 2011. Any nominations for uh, chair? I'd like to nominate uh, uh, member uh, Brian Brand. Yeah, I'll sure. second that. All in favor? Uh, any opposed? Okay, Brian, you're here in the chair. You, this. I, stay where you are. The, look, the, let's change. Oh, here. oh that's fine. Right. Kathy. <laughs> are you interested in vice chair? Kathy. <laughs> she look at your way. <laughs> I see everybody at once trying, uh, <laughs> reaching their hands for supervisor. Uh, the uh, Traditionally, we've gone with the city appointment and then gone to a county or supervisor appointment. So I know you all want it, so I will just flip it, keep flipping coins. Uh, he has it. He has it. Peter has it. He hasn't had the chance to bang the gavel up here. I knew I was going to I've never been. Are you saying no to my. My request. That's, I didn't need a chance to ask. Oh wow! Oh, I'd like to nominate uh, Supervisor Long uh, for the vice chair position. I'll second that. Okay. Seeing uh, no, there. I'll go ahead. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you, Supervisor. All right. We'll move to we'll move to our regular agenda. And just as a reminder, um, it takes six for a quorum, so if we have to leave the room, if we can just be aware of that. Um, we're, we're right on the edges of that today. Okay, so we'll move to the next agenda item, which is the summary minutes from the uh, December 14th meeting. Move approval. Second. All right. Anybody opposed? Nope. See none. Motion carries. And uh, uh, Roberta, thank you so much. Uh, summary minutes um, works, I think, with the meetings being televised. Uh, folks want the verbatim to go back and do it. I think they can go listen to the, the record, which is out there on the web. And I think just having the summary minutes about the motions, I think, will help us stay on top and also uh, loosen up some uh, clerical time, too. So thank you so much for bringing it to us in this room. 
this way. Move to our next agenda item, which is uh, appointments of various committees, commissions, and forums. Um, we need to appoint two Air Pollution Control District board members to the Air Pollution Control Standing Committee. Oh, thank you. You know what? I'm going through. Yeah, let me go back. I'm going through the items. That's okay. Just a warm up. All righty. Then, uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. We'll go back to board comments. Any comments from the board? I just, um, as, as a past year, I just want to thank uh, Michael and his staff for the assistance in the past year and congratulate you as a new chair, you know, and, and Kathy as the vice chair. You know. And it was a great year. And um, I know thank you, Michael, and your staff for all the, the assistance throughout the year. Yes, past year. Thank you. Mr. Morgan? Um, I, I think I brought this up last time, but I can't remember. <laughs> it's getting short. I'm getting older. But uh, the Tri-Counties chap, you know, Tri-Counties part of Air Quality Control Board. Any news, Mike? Or the minutes from the uh, meeting of the basin wide group, the basin wide control council. Well, I call it three counties because it's yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, the South Central Coast Basin yeah. Wide Control Council. Okay. Yeah, they're they're the last item in this board agenda. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to ask him to give us a little update on that when he comes back up. But thank you. Any other further board comments? Okay, we'll move to our regular agenda, which we've already. We'll move to item nine. Which is approval of board chair appointments for two board members to the Air Pollution Standing Committee and one board member to as the district representative of the South Coast Basin Wide Air Pollution Control District. I'm presently just recently took on that role, so I'd be happy to fulfill that one in the, in the Basin Wide, which is at San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara County. I'm, I'm happy to serve on the Standing Committee after leaning on Supervisor Long for the, for the chair, so I'd be happy to do that. Great. I would also like to, Mr. Morgan, do you have time for the yes. standing committee? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to have you as two city yeah. representatives. So uh, we'd love to have you on there too, Mike. So then uh, I will go ahead and, as the chair, sit in that seat also. Uh, so continuity, as we'll be here for all the meetings, um, we'll go ahead then and propose that uh, um, Mr. Morgan and myself, and then I'm sorry, Supervisor Bennett, and I'm sorry, they're there. Yeah, no, vice chair, of course, automatic. So if everybody's okay with that, uh, I'll make the mo yeah the motion and so move. Great. Second. Great. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. And I see no disapproval, so motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to item 10, which is our rulemaking calendar. Mike, if you want to perhaps introduce this and then talk about is there anything new and. Uh, uh, and, and some uh, give us an update on that. Thank you. Sure. Chair Brennan, members of the board, I'm Mike Vegas, Air Pollution Control Officer. Health and Safety Code requires the district to publish a list of regulatory measures scheduled for consideration by your board each year, and we have to publish this each January, and this has been posted on our website since December. District staff has created this calendar to comply with the requirement. The calendar includes rulemaking activities scheduled or tentatively scheduled for your board's consideration during 2011. The rulemaking calendar lists new and revised rules to implement our all feasible measures requirements to make improvements to existing rules and rule revisions are required under state or federal mandates. State law does not require that the calendar include the mandated actions, but we have tried to make it as comprehensive as possible. I'd like to point out that we have a, included a potential rule action to define waste conversion technologies as an essential public service. However, before ABCD staff would embark on such a rulemaking effort, the issue would be presented to your board for direction. Waste conversion is an emerging technology and can be a potential alternative to landfilling municipal solid waste. Uh, staff recommends your board approve the proposed rulemaking calendar. Okay. And Mike, obviously if it's on the calendar, a quick question for us, could you, or maybe a refresher. On the uh, staff time, um, do, are we able to recoup that in some way, or how's, how's that, uh, how do we, rec um, we work on all of these, and is there a funding source to help us with that? There is a funding source. We, we don't recoup the uh, staff time for a specific rule revision from any party. It's, 
generally funded from our federal grant and uh, permit renewal fees for stationary source rulemaking. Okay, appreciate that. Any other questions? Yes, uh, just, Mr. Chairman, just one. Is this being uh, about the you know trash, the uh, I call it the destruction of trash, but the pyroplastic kind of thing that's being proposed in a couple of places? Yeah, it would either be pyrolysis, which Ralph. is you know heating to a very high temperature in the absence of oxygen, or uh, plasma arc, which is in essence like a lightning type of approach to. You have a couple of those that are being proposed. Uh, there is one, uh, I believe, in Oregon, looking at Plasmark. There's a couple companies. There's IES, which is working with pyrolysis. They currently have a demonstration unit up at McClellan Air Force Base in the Sacramento region. And uh, Plasco is a Canadian company that is, that is working on a plasma arc, and they have a unit up there in Ottawa, I believe. I think Harrison Industries were considering this. Uh, they were dealing with someone. That's why I was asking if they'd talk to you at all. Uh, Harrison has not spoken to us yet. Uh, Santa Barbara County has set up a kind of multifaceted look at this type of technology mm -hmm. where they've taken their solid waste division. Uh, some of the cities and the county and the air district, I believe, is, is participating at least as an observer uh, and to look at these alternatives because they're considering what are they going to do? Are they going to land? <coughs> or are they going to go with some type of digester or, or paralysis plasma arc? Okay. Well, you will begin call from them. Most likely, I'm sure, I'll hear me hearing from Harrison. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> the issue, though, on this new source review definition is a public policy issue for this body to have a good discussion as to whether or not these waste conversion operations are classified as essential public service. So I would just just say to our, our board members that we – that. Um, I think there, there needs to be um, good, good, solid work done on this by staff analysis, um, looking at the pros and cons for both the public benefit um, and or not, and um, that we take our time with this item. It's a significant change to that public policy. Madam Chair, I appreciate those comments. I uh, myself uh, feel the same way. While it's new and emerging technology, and that's how we move forward, the new and emerging technologies also have some drawbacks. And I feel very fortunate that the team we've put together, certainly I know uh, um, uh, Mr. Baldwin has uh, been working with VRST to uh, ferret this out a little bit. And so I would hope that we could maybe have this come back maybe on a quarterly basis and update on where we are. Um, only because I think in some instances, um, you know, it's very – back in the 60s, we were burning things. Now it's called a little different – something mm -hmm. different. And, but it is. There's nothing coming out. In the old days, it just went into the air. Now it's a question of just being able to be able to scrub those and save those and pull all this bad stuff out, and if that's possible. Uh, my indications are it's presently not legal in the state of California and possibly not going to be legal, but that's because there isn't anything really out there. Um, so by coming forward, obviously the uh, uh, city of Los Angeles is looking at this. Some of the big um, other cities and municipalities, and that's the kind of thing that changes perception, changes laws, especially if technology can keep up. So I think it's going to be a team effort, and I look forward to – but I would like it to come back maybe on, uh, uh, on a quarterly basis so we don't kind of get so far down the road that expectations are so high, and then we have to kind of back off and be the ones that have to maybe put a little uh, water on the fire, so to speak. And so I would just want to make that as a point. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I heard uh, that was illegal. Pyrolysis is illegal in California? I didn't say illegal. It hasn't, it's, what we're talking about has not been totally legalized. I think there's okay, been permitted in this point. So. Permitted, okay. Yeah, but it's, not, it's legal, but it's not permitted yet here. Actually, I believe the, uh, the unit in Sacramento, uh, McClellan Air Force Base, does have a permit from Sacramento yes. Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. And there was that, I think that was a research or something it's a de demonstration, uh, demonstration project, kind of size. like it's it's not opening it up for everybody. It's just kind of exactly. doing it this way. So we need to take baby steps and uh, before we take the big ones. Didn't so. they also have one in Palm Springs or somewhere down there? Not that I'm aware of in California. The demonstration unit up in up in the Sacramento region is really what they're trying to do is get a, a handle on the air emissions is a, is a big part of that demonstration project. Great. Okay, no more questions. Uh, pleasure of the board. Uh, move the recommended action calendar as recommended. Second. Okay, second by Mr. Morgan. Uh, okay, all in favor? 
Okay. Aye. So Aye. no disapproval. Well, that one carries unanimously. We'll move to um, uh, item 11. Now, this item is I'm going to be giving your board a study session on greenhouse gas permitting. And I know that uh, I think it was kind of a surprise to our advisory committee just because a lot of people read the paper and they say, well, you know, Congress hasn't acted on greenhouse gas cap and trade, and, and then suddenly all these permitting agencies are moving forward on greenhouse gas permitting. So I wanted to give you the background on where we're heading on a rule of action that's going to be coming to your board on March 8th. This is the case that started the ball rolling on the regulation of greenhouse gas emissions on a nationwide basis under the Federal Clean Air Act. The result of this Supreme Court case in Massachusetts versus EPA was that EPA was required to determine whether or not greenhouse gases from motor vehicles cause or contribute to air pollution, which may be reasonably anticipated to endanger public health or welfare under the Federal Clean Air Act. In response to the Supreme Court decision, EPA Administrator undertook an effort to make this finding, and it's known as an endangerment finding. And this finding found that current and projected levels of six greenhouse gases threaten public health and welfare. This means that greenhouse gases are air pollutants under the Federal Clean Air Act, and this is quite significant because when you think about it, our permit programs deal with all regulated air pollutants. And now suddenly, we've got carbon dioxide and five other pollutants as suddenly now known as air pollutants. This finding also allowed the EPA and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration to promulgate vehicle standards for greenhouse gases. The EPA the National Highway Safety Administration regulation established new light duty standards to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve fuel economy. These requirements are based on California greenhouse gas vehicle emission standards, which were known as the Pavley Law after Senator Fran Pavley. The regulation will apply to vehicles starting in the model year 2012 and actually became effective on January 2nd of this year. Now, people like me and a lot of the other agencies throughout the country were concerned as, when, what does this mean it's, it's now an air pollutant? Because our rules say that we have to permit all regulated air pollutants. So based on the endangerment finding that greenhouse gases are air pollutants under the Clean Air Act, EPA moved forward on an interpretive memo to determine whether when there are regulated air pollutants. This was done under uh, Administrator Johnson from the Bush administration. And, and the interpretive memo states that an air pollutant becomes subject to regulation when there is a control requirement in a regulation promulgated under the Clean Air Act. And this was quite a relief to the permitting agencies because a couple of years back when all this was going, nobody was ready to start permitting greenhouse gases. This means that greenhouse gases became subject to Federal Clean Air Act permitting requirements on January 2nd of this year. To deal with this permitting issue in a reasonable manner, EPA promulgated what they're calling a tailoring rule. And the term tailoring refers to tailoring greenhouse gas permit thresholds to a level that is reasonable. The tailoring rule sets Title V thresholds for permitting at 100,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent and sets prevention of significant deterioration permitting thresholds at 100,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for new sources and 75,000 tons per year at modified sources. I need to explain this term CO2 equivalent. Under EPA regulations, they're dealing with six compounds, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perlofluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride. Each one of these compounds has a different global warming potential. They have assigned a, put a global warming potential of one to carbon dioxide. And for example, methane has a global warming potential 21 times higher than carbon dioxide. Therefore, one ton of methane is equal to 21 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. 
And this is how we would do these calculations, especially if we were looking at a landfill, because you would have some fugitive methane being emitted, in, despite of the fact we have all the, the controls on, on the landfill. And then when you burn that methane that you did control, you would create some carbon dioxide, either from the flare or the engine or the, or the turbine, which was also in, in place to control those methane emissions. So this is kind of how we'll be approaching these thresholds for calculations. If one looks at the current federal permitting thresholds for criteria pollutants, you see the thresholds range from 100 tons per year to 250 tons per year. Greenhouse gases are emitted in quantities vastly greater than this. If existing permit, federal permit thresholds were retained and used for greenhouse gases, there would be an extreme hardship placed on both the regulated community and permitting agencies. Sure. With these current criteria pollutant thresholds, there are approximately 15,000 Title V permits nationwide. If greenhouse gases were subject to these current criteria thresholds, EPA estimates there could be up to 6 million Title V permits nationwide. They refer to this as an absurd result. This points to the need to set appropriate greenhouse gas permitting thresholds, as they propose at the 100,000 and 75,000 ton per year levels. Looking at this from another perspective, if you take those 100,000 and 75,000 thresholds and, and look at all the stationary source CO2 emissions, these this thresholds that are being proposed would capture about 70% of those emissions. Now, if you go back to the criteria pollutant thresholds and look at nitrogen oxides, which are a precursor to ozone, those thresholds capture about 70% of the nitrogen oxide on a nationwide basis. So. From that perspective, it seems that EPA got it right on this rulemaking. On the local impact, for Ventura County, we have 1,419 sources on permit with 26 Title V sources. A quick estimate by our staff shows we could expect somewhere around the neighborhood of 300 Title V permits if we, the 100 ton per year threshold was maintained. We couldn't handle this workload with existing staff, not to mention the additional impact on the regulated community. To avoid these potential adverse impacts to the regulated community of the district, we are undertaking a rulemaking to revise our Title V permit thresholds to reflect those found in EPA's tailoring rule for greenhouse gases. We conducted our public workshop on September 21st, and industry representatives understood that the district was proposing to take action to protect their interests and the interests of the districts on this issue. The only concern raised at the workshop on whether or not the district was going to assess fees beyond our existing permit processing fees. Based on the fact that we envision very limited work beyond the actual permitting, we're not proposing to assess any additional fees at this time for the program. The district's advisory committee recommended adoption of the proposed rule action by a vote of eight to three. The main concerns raised by members voting no were regarding the quality of science behind climate change, a feeling the district was rushing forward on a rule action where the rule action could be delayed a few months, especially in light in recent changes in Congress. And I do have to say that there are two bills were just in, uh, introduced this week that would delay implementation of the tailoring rule. Uh, but the mandate is still moving forward. And, you know, I've talked to county council, and if we move forward to take action to you know, both protect our interests and the regulated community, and Congress did delay the implementation of this greenhouse gas permitting, then we would certainly suspend our efforts, and I'd return to your board to take action to correct that. So I'm trying to steer the prudent course here. To date, 49 states have committed to take similar rule actions to implement this mandate. Uh, right now, only Texas is fighting back with EPA, and uh, it's gone to court already. Just to let you know, this isn't the only action that's going to be related to greenhouse gas permitting. Uh, so in the first half of this year, we'll be proposing to adopt by reference EPA's Prevention of Significant Deterioration Regulation, so the district would become the lead agency for these permits. 
This would likely be seen as advantageous by the regulated community here in Ventura County as if they needed a PSD permit, and these don't occur very often. As a matter of fact, in my time at the district, we have not had a PSD permit. Is there very large modifications or a, something like a new power plant moving into the county? They'd be working with the district instead of EPA, and I think, you know, based on our working relationship with industry and the time it takes to work with EPA, I think they would be quite pleased to be working with us. And this permitting program would include criteria pollutants and greenhouse gases. And just recently, EPA released a model rule that we'll be utilizing to implement this mandate. But that's really a discussion for another day. Uh, that's all I have at this time. I'll be happy to take questions. Questions? Comments? Action? I have it's a lot of permitting that will have to occur, it sounds like. Is it um, also a lot of applicants, or are there just some major ones that will be it, it, most affected? It would just be that the, most likely our existing Title V facilities, those 26, would have to quantify their greenhouse gas emissions in this first phase. So it's not going to be a lot of work for them, or it's going to be some work for them to quantify those greenhouse gas emissions. It's not going to be a real significant load on us if that's the number. We might see one other uh, facility, something like that, come in under the thresholds, but we're not looking at a real significant uptick in our number of Title V permits. What, what does it do to those people that have to? I mean, they will qualify under this, you're saying? Well, what would happen is those large Title V, once you're in Title V, you're in for good is kind of how it works. And they would have to quantify, basically allow us to understand their carbon, their greenhouse gas emissions. And we would set those greenhouse gas emissions on their permit. It would not be a permitted emission level that they could not exceed. It would just be emissions on a permit. I mean, it's, it's, there's not a requirement that says if you said I emit 150,000 tons, 150, tons per year of carbon dioxide equivalent, it's not to say the next year if your, your throughput goes up, you couldn't adjust that because there's not a requirement keeping you at that level. So it would really just be a quantification exercise at this time. So it doesn't put them out of business if that kind of situation where they couldn't produce or keep continue to go? That's correct. It would not. And really what this action does is it protects those <laughs> 1,419 minus 26, those, <laughs> those 1,400 facilities in essence from having to go through Title V. Oh, it does. That, that's basically it raises the threshold so it's clear they do not need a permit. And as part of the permit action, you're going to see us, uh, the rulemaking action that we're going to bring to you in March 8th, you're going to see we're also making some rule changes to make it fairly straightforward for a lot of those sources to stay out of it, to, to prove that they're out of Title V, in essence. Okay. I, one question. Mm -hmm. If a new Title V business or industry came to Ventura County, um, what would they have to go through? It, same same thing? Or, or is it new, would it be new qualifications because they're new? How would they be handled? Well, they, it would be the standard. This is one of the frustrations when we did Title V. California has a robust permit program. Right. They, they would go through the California program. And once you get through the California program, there's some additional administrative requirements with Title V uh, permits. For instance, in, in, our, in, in the California program, we have all the requirements that apply to you. We explain how they apply to you and what your emission limits are, reporting, record keeping, et cetera. Under Title V, there's additional uh, record keeping and reporting, and also they, they also have to have findings showing that basically proving that all these other requirements that don't apply to you, why they don't apply to you. So it's, but I mean, I, I think from a permitting standpoint, it, it's going to be, it's doable if a new major source had to move in. But the, the tough thing in Ventura County, obviously, is not the greenhouse gas side is, is it going to be issued. It's going to be just are there emission reduction credits available to accommodate a large facility. Okay. okay the action on this is a receiving file. There's no further questions. So moved. Second by Supervisor Foy. Okay. Not seeing any objections. Motion carries. We'll move to item 12. 
the file the 2010 pesticide emission reduction study. Chair Ben, members of the board, I'm Stan Cowan, our quality engineer. Uh, the purpose of this receiving file item is to report back on the 2010 fumigant emission uh, reduction study that was performed by UC Davis and was funded by the Clean Air Fund. Uh, this $30,000 study was performed under the auspices of the California Strawberry Commission and the final report was an attachment to the board letter. There were three objectives of the study. First, to test the permeability of the different tarps used to cover fields and to trap the fumigant underneath. Second uh, objective was to implement an outreach plan to stakeholders, to farmers, so they would implement this new technique. And the third uh, objective was to demonstrate the effectiveness of these new tarps to trap the, fum the fumigant. The research collected was critical information, which is being used by the Ag Commissioner to set standards for fumigant applica applications. For example, a permit condition was revised to restrict the use of the more permeable tarps when applying chloropicrin on fields within a quarter mile of occupied structures. Uh, based on the work of the study, about 1,000 acres of strawberry fields, or about 10% of, of the retentive tarps were used. This caused about emission reduction of about 3,000 pounds of 1,3-dichloropropane and chloropicrin. Uh, growers, growers are able to compare yield control and fruit production when using the two different types of tarps. Uh, the following observations were made. Weed control was better under the more efficient VIF tarps. The fruit yield was similar when using lower application rates of the fumigant. Uh, in comparison to the normal operation. And finally, the higher price of the tarps, about 40%, is balanced by reduced weeding costs and also by the lower fumigant application rate. So they use less fumigant when they use these, these less permeable tarps. And uh, those are the extent of my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, um, first of all, I think it's um, great we're heading in that direction. Is there anybody from the Ag Commissioner's office? I don't see anybody here comments, but... I just was hoping, um, I think this is a great way to start. Um, I recognize, do we have some actual dollars and cents? And well, it does say that, um, you know, they use less fumigants. I mean, a 40% increase in cost. Right. Well, I think it's certainly a public benefit. Um, also, we've got to want to get to the table and say, how can we balance that? And if I was hoping that, you know, maybe there's some way, the, the, the initial study showed this is very, very positive. And if we're not close on the costs or we're, 20 percent cost you 20 percent more. Maybe there's something we could do as a, a district that could maybe help buy down that extra 20 percent and maybe make the cost the same, so that people would start doing that a little bit. But do we have any hard cost dollars on uh, I could, how much I, they've saved? Because that, uh, to me, would really help. Well, I don't want to dictate we go do it automatically. It sometimes I, I think there, know is, that there is a cost, sense. but I think uh, you know the. You know where they have to do it near occupied residences. Mm -hmm. I think they're doing it, uh, especially because when, when the permit condition says they have to do it. So, uh, as far as I, we could do some research and find out what kinds of incentives might be viable for that kind of approach. And the reason I say that is because rather than having two or three different kinds of systems out there, they also mentioned a couple of things. It's a little harder to, to put down. Probably it's probably not as you know, flexible and things like right. that. So if they switched over, they develop perhaps some equipment that could help that. And rather have it be such a specialized market, only now 10%, it would be great to see it be embraced and go f almost everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, of course, total amount of, uh, uh, of we know, the total amount of fumigants used collectively in the system is a benefit to everybody. But I think that would help, and then maybe we could work a little closer with the Ag Commission to try to do that. And yeah. while we have a Carl, Carl Moyer fund for something, maybe we're able to help them bring it closer. That's just my personal thoughts after reading this. Pleasure of the board. You're going to say I just want you to know the uh, Ag Commissioner's office did uh, review this board letter, and we, we kept them apprised of this one. And uh, one of the things Stan alluded to is uh, the, the current, the new permits that they're issuing for fumigation, this virtually impermeable form is, film is required near occupied uh, housing, schools, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Did the, I was going to ask, did the farm community agree with the study? I mean, they saw the differences or just a study and they haven't? I, I think <clears throat> you're starting to see it actually be used, so I think some of them are... So, 
it's been explained to me there's some that are quite innovative and, and some a little more resistant to change, and it's starting to get out there in the market. Yeah, I was just curious, coming up with what uh, he had said about the balance of cost, if the study shows it, but the farmers are actually doing it, showing that, yeah, maybe we can make this cost up, would be good, yeah, versus forcing something on right now. Yeah. Mr. Morgan? Yeah, two of the things that I, I was looking at that and caught the same thing, because you have, I know it's less cost for weeds because you don't have, to, don't have as many weeds, but uh, you have to adjust the tarps and all that stuff. There's a balance maybe there. But also, what's the cost and what's the resilience of this, of the, this film uh, compared to tarps? I mean, will it cost them more? Can they use it again? Or how many times can they use it compared to tarp? And so the cost factor there wasn't, you know, in play. I kind of like to know what that would be. My understanding is both methods you use at once. Mm -hmm. Once? Yeah, one time. Just both. I thought tarps used twice, sorry. Mm -hmm. Nope. And that brings up the question that um, I'm not in a certain part of this, but if it's holding a lot more of the fumigant into the, well, hopefully going into the soil, and keep, then the question is, where are we doing with the tarps? Where, when the film's taken off, you know, has it become another toxic issue, and is that something that's contributing to the cost for the uh, farmer to get rid of? That's another one to factor in. Yeah, um, be recycled too. yeah well, I mean, looking at the whole the whole circle of it, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think is, is important. I want you want it to be sustainable, and we want this to work. Um, and while I know that you know it's tougher and tougher to farm in this county, we can certainly try to make it a little bit easier, but uh, uh, but also make sure that the public's good is being taken into account, and hopefully move in that direction with the incentives. So. Um, further comments? And, you know, I, I was thinking the same thing uh, regarding what you're doing with the tarps when they're finished and how much residue is on them. But I, I believe there is a company, I, I, if they're still in business, in Camarillo that actually recycles these, the film and use it for other products. So is the, sure does this VIF, uh, do you know if it is that? Recyclable material. That we'll look into that. I'd have to look into that for you. I'm not sure if they're still there. They actually, yeah, I know they were doing it. Maybe. Yeah. They were they started were. off initially ran up against a number of problems. I don't know if it was the, the the just the handling of it, and I heard that they were closed or in the process of closing. Unfortunately, we've done everything in this county to try to keep them alive. I know through this in the county's integrated waste waste management uh, department, doing everything they can. I don't know where that stands. Uh, yeah, I, I actually remember an article, business section article on that company, and, and they, they were facing financial hardship. During the recession, the, the cost of recycled, the market for recycled plastic was hurt badly, and the price dropped dramatically on right. them. And that. And the other thing is just when you pick it up from the fields, it has a lot of dirt on it, and they were working on some new equipment to try to get that dirt off before you head to the recycler. Supervisor Moore? Just a thought to have the um, Ag Commissioner work with you to prepare mm -hmm. uh, answers to questions and kind of what you've heard today and, and make it available to all of us. Absolutely. So we hear it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's a, one is a good study that was done and was needed and, yep. Yep. and in progress um, because it's been a great concern with strawberries being our number one crop. So, All right. Would um, the uh, proposed use of methyl iodide be used with these types of film? That's a great question. Actually, because of the toxicity of methyl iodide, it looks like these tarps will be required for the use with methyl iodide. It is really important to find out about mm -hmm. the residue issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, move to receive a file. Second. Okay. See no opposition. Item curious. Thank you, Mike. That's I'm glad and I'm glad we have the uh, the resources of UC Davis, and I appreciate the uh, um, staff bringing this forward. And if you, you, you kind of know what's going on in the county, you see other opportunities to perhaps help some of the other industries that are coming with. I think this is a good use of this board and funds, so bring it forward as it comes up, at least to us, please. We can move to item 13. As part of our biennial review of our conflict of interest code, district staff is proposing to amend our Exhibit A to include the new engineering manager and the monitoring manager and delete the supervising meteorologist and reduce the number of positions from two to three for our supervising air quality engineers. There are no other changes proposed at this time. As you can see, these are just changes uh, as we implemented phase one of our secession planning. Okay. Opposition item carries. All right. 
And obviously item 14 is a cancellation of the February 8th regular board meeting. I know you're all heartbroken about that. I hope that you got into your new positions. We're going to direct all your staff to do all this great work. And we cut it off. But I'm sorry. You'll have to wait till March. Okay. That one carries. I know there won't be anybody opposed to that. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Morgan, you had some questions. Item 15 is a review, uh, just a filing of the minutes um, of uh, based on wide uh, control council. Um, you're welcome to uh, uh, review all those. And, and I appreciate uh, Mike putting them in, in here. It keeps it helps the uh, the board as a whole stay abreast of what's going on. Uh, I just want to see if we had comments from our board president. I mean, our representative. Is that uh, you know the meeting? Um, there, but I guess you've got reviewed enough here. You don't need to make a comment. Yeah, thank you. No, I was um, very well put in, and uh, mm -hmm. also we talked about the greenhouse gas uh, mm -hmm. in the last one. So. All right. Seeing uh, this, the work of this board's being done. We'll um, adjourn. To file. Okay. We'll receiving. Second by Supervisor Parks. No opposition. Thank you. Thank you for Roberta for uh, keeping me tuned in there. Um, we were going to adjourn to a standing committee meeting, short standing committee meeting, I believe upstairs in the conference room at the CEO's office. Oh, apologize. I didn't see any. 16. I didn't see any uh, um, uh, cards in front of me, so I assume there's no public comment. Um, great. Thank you. Upstairs for a sta short standing committee. Okay, and I'll get them right back down here for your uh, closed session.